Welcome, everybody. Uh, my pleasure to move us on to our next session. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Benjamin Chan and Dr. John Koff. Dr. Chan is an associate research scientist in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at Yale University. He's known for his work in phage therapy, exploiting genetic trade-offs to treat antibiotic resistant bacterial infections. His work spans the entire bench to bedside spectrum, and he has successfully isolated, characterized, and used bacteriophages to treat several infections. Featured in the Netflix series, Follow This, his research has reinvigorated phage therapy in Western medicine. Dr. Koff completed fellowship training in pulmonary and critical care medicine at UC San Francisco, where he went on to become the associate director of the adult cystic fibrosis program and member of the lung transplantation program. Dr. Koff joined the faculty at Yale University in 2011 to direct the adult CF program and to continue his research that focuses on pulmonary immunology. We welcome Dr. Chan and Dr. Koff as they present advances in phage therapy as a treatment for cystic fibrosis. Cool. Um, thanks for having us and for the um, very kind intro. Um, I'm Ben, um, and uh, John and I are going to split this talk. Um, and so, yeah, so I guess you get me for the first two thirds of this. Um, and so I just thought for my bit, we'd talk about the Phage Center here at Yale, the Center at Yale for Phage Biology and Therapy, which is, I guess this is more or less an unofficial uh, announcement um, of our like opening, um, where we cover sort of the basic translational and clinical um, bits of uh, phage therapy. So, um, so, so like I said, we, we have three parts, discovery, development, and deployment of uh, bacteriophage-based therapies, um, starting in the, you know, pond, sewer, water, whatever, where we isolate and uh, isolate bacteriophages, we bring those to the lab um, and, and study them at the bench to characterize them and, you know, hopefully prepare some of them for, for clinical use. And then we use them in the clinic here and in other places. Um, and then we sort of bring them back to the bench and tweak them with patient samples, with you know, see what worked, what didn't work, different nebulizers. Um, so that, that's basically the whole center. And so today I'll talk to you guys for about uh, 20 minutes or so on the first two parts of this, and then I'll hand it over to John um, and he'll talk about the cool uh, clinical stuff. So, um, so at the center, we do, you know, like I said, these, these three parts, isolation, characterization, potential is what we do in the beginning uh, with the first fresh phages we pull out of the environment. Um, but before I can talk about sort of the discovery side, I thought I'd just talk about phages really briefly so that we're all on the same uh, same page or whatever. Um, so bacteriophages, as you'll probably hear uh, later um, in, in some of the other talks, are the most numerous life forms on earth. Um, there are maybe 10 to the 31st of them on the planet, um, but they, have, they definitely have a number of bacteria. Um, and they were discovered about a hundred years ago by a couple of people. Uh, Felix Durrell um, and, and Torp. Um, and here's just a quick, you know, cartoon illustrating some of the diversity of these phages. Um, this is, I don't know, it looks like yeah, maybe 150, 200 of, of the phages from our library that we sequenced. Um, and, and, you know, they, they span all sorts of different families and we have several new genera described. Um, and very basically they, I thought I'd cover the life cycle. Um, and so this blue, little Sputnik looking probe thing is a bacteriophage, an illustration of one, um, and the green oval is supposed to represent a bacteria. Uh, the first step in their life cycle is to attach to the host, in this case, bacteria. Um, and then they inject their nucleic acid, um, they make copies of it, they make new parts to assemble phages, and they assemble the phage particles, throw DNA in, and then the last step, they burst, and each of these uh, phage particles goes on to find a new uh, bacterial host to re to repeat the cycle. Um, so we study a lot of the first bit, um, the attachment uh, here in the lab. And um, it's, it's actually, you know, kind of complicated. It's not just as simple as just like sticking necessarily um, in that the phage has to recognize a particular receptor or receptors on the surface of a bacteria. Um, and 
these surface receptors are like sugars, proteins, fat, something that can be recognized. Um, and they're not present on all members of a genus. And even within a species, often we have, you know, just one very specific isolate is sensitive to a particular phage. Um, so the bacteriophage bounces around in the environment until it bumps into one of these uh, receptors that it's the proper one, it, it sticks to it and starts the infectious process, right? So this means that bacteriophages are extremely specific um, to what uh, types of bacteria they can infect. Um, and historically, I think this was viewed uh, negatively and that you'd have to throw, you know, hundreds of different bacteriophages into a cocktail in order to make it a viable um, product that's able to actually have any um, spectrum of activity. However, I think recently, um, as we're, you know, appreciating the microbiome a lot more, um, I think it's becoming more of a, one of the good aspects of bacteriophage. Um, and I hope to, you know, further convince you of that here um, today. So if you think of, uh, you know, a more, a closed system of the bacteria uh, and bacteriophage in a, in a cycle where the phages are infecting and reproducing, um, eventually uh, life sort of finds a way <laughs> um, and the bacteria, you know, as a community will evolve away from sensitivity to the bacteriophage. Um, and, and here uh, at the phage center, we are hoping that we can direct this evolutionary response um, to reduce or reverse antibiotic resistance um, and or attenuate virulence. Um, and we think of it as, as sort of a spectrum here where on the left, we have a really virulent or, or you know, a bacteria that's highly resistant to antibiotics. Um, and then over here on the right, uh, but also, sorry, resistant to phage. And then over here on the right, we have something that's totally resistant to phage, you know, smoke, um, and with attenuated virulence, right? So it's like, a, it's a trade-off um, along a spectrum here and different strains will be in different positions, but, but we hope to sort of play with the spectrum here uh, to, to improve, you know, outcomes in people. Um, and so our take on this is more like a phage therapy sort of 2.0 because we're basically trying to design therapeutics that work with antibiotics or the immune and or the immune system. Um, and, and we're focusing really specifically on a lot of these uh, factors involved in virulence um, and antibiotic resistance. Um, so for example, you know, if you just throw a bunch of penicillin at something, it, it might result in increased beta lactamase production, right? Which isn't necessarily very helpful um, for the person um, that's, that's now full of antibiotic resistant bacteria. Um, but in, in the phage therapy case, we're working on like targeting very specific things, you know, like, uh, you know, motility or biofilm production. And so maybe the bacteria are, you know, less modal, they can't biofilms or they have in, increased antibiotic sensitivity, um, something that we could actually benefit off in a, in a trade-off. Okay. So now to the first bit here, let me just quadruple check the time because I don't want to go over. Um, the first step is, is isolation in, in phage therapy, uh, characterization of phages. And, you know, finding phages is pretty easy because like I said, they're the most numerous um, organism on the planet, but finding like the right one or good ones for therapeutic development is a little bit less simple. Um, but it, at least in our group, it starts all the same way. Um, and we get a water sample um, from you know, sewage, pond, lake, compost, ditch, whatever. Um, we then do what's an enrichment. Same process has been done for, you know, decades um, in, in biology here. And we actually expose that water sample to, you know, a, a strain of bacteria. And, the, and several of these here on the list are obviously CF relevant and, and many others less so. Um, but we then use that to grow. And so whatever phage can infect that strain will, will multiply. Um, we purify the, the phages from those samples, um, you know, and many of them don't pass this step because they're like not stable or, or, or whatever. Um, once we have a pure culture of the phage that's stable enough, we try to identify its receptor that we talked about earlier. Um, and through, you know, uh, infecting a bunch of transposon knockouts or some of these other high, high throughput techniques we've developed. Um, from there, we do the genome once we have a good one. Um, and then that, you know, uses a receptor that is meaningful clinically. Um, we, we sequence the phage and then we exclude some of these phages that have genes that are maybe undesirable, like, uh, temperate phage, and then those that are able to, uh, that are carrying, you know, some, some other undesired gene. So from there, 
we characterize the phages even further. Um, we generate what's called like a lytic spectrum or a lytic table, where we determine the phages uh, ability to infect and kill a panel of bacteria. So in this case, this is just an illustration of, of 100 or so Pseudomonas serogenose isolates that were kindly provided by the CF Foundation. Um, and then several phages here where the green, so each column is a bacteria and each row is a phage. And then it's basically testing the sensitivity and resistance of each of these strains um, to sort of show how broad, uh, broad spectrum, I guess, uh, particular phages on a relevant panel of bacteria. Okay, so we have all that like basic, you know, discovery information on these phages. Um, and then we start trying to develop them into, you know, medicine really. Um, and so to do that, you know, some of the, the critical parts we do are mutational spectrum resistance, which we'll get to, cross resistance, and we try to optimize them for treatment. Um, but before we get there, we just gotta be extra careful because there are, we have examples in the lab, uh, fortunately not in person yet, because uh, I think hopefully we did sufficient characterization before it ends up in a person, but where we have a bacteria that's phage sensitive and virulent, but um, after exposure to phage and then evolved resistance, you actually get it to be phage resistant and like actually extra virulent um, or increased antibiotic sensitivity. So we just need to be extra careful um, in developing these phages to make sure we're doing the right thing, okay? All right, so, um, so back to the lytic table here, um, we try to determine the mutational spectrum of resistance. And to do that uh, in the simplest way, let's just look at these three phages here, uh, to pH 6, 27, and 01. So, you know, this is just the data reformatted and that TIP pH 6 killed 76 out of 100 of these isolates, 27 killed 65, and then uh, 01 here on the right killed 77 of them, right? And so um, they're named TIP P something uh, because of our naming convention in the lab is we try to name it after what we believe to be the receptor binding site. So in this case, all three of these phages use the type 4 pillus, which is uh, used in motility uh, in pseudomonas. So anyway, so we have these three phages. We then uh, sequence all the, the, the green boxes here. So all the strains that are sensitive to these phages, we, we uh, deep sequence those. Um, we also expose these strains to the phage. Um, and then we took five independent replicates um, uh, and then we sequenced all those. So we have five replicates for resistant mutants for ra randomly selected resistant mutants to each of these strains. So five times 76, five times 65, five times 77. We sequence them all. Um, and then we take the data that comes out of the sequencers, run it through Python scripts. Um, and then we you know, get rid of the, the, the bad reads. Um, and then we remove the alignments to the phage sensitive ancestors. So what we're doing is we're looking for reads that are different uh, in the evolved resistance strains. Um, and then, you know, we, we find out where those reads align to the genome and we quantify the number of mutations per nucleotide, per gene, per pathway to generate um, a heat map, which we'll see here in a second. Um, but it's like a really big heat map and uh, maybe not the most informative, right? So in this table, in the columns, we have different phage resistant strains. And then the rows are different genes of Pseudomonas. Uh, and the intensity of red is the uh, number of uh, mutations in that gene. Okay, so the brighter red, the more mutations. And so you get, you know, across the whole Pseudomonas serogenosia genome, you get like a, a pretty big panel here. And so, you know, manually going through and looking through this is not going to be very helpful. Um, so we needed a way to make this sort of more meaningful. And to do that, we basically just did some statistics, right? So you compare the number of hits per gene per pathway um, and try to reduce the number of false negatives um, and correct for, you know, random mutation or sorry, the, the sequencing error rate. Um, and then once, once you do that, it actually comes out to be a lot cleaner. Um, and in this case, things distilled into, you know, four-ish genes, um, all in the same group. Um, so most of the strains uh, had mutations in pill L, which is one of these pillus genes. Um, and then there was one here at the right, which surprisingly did not have mutations there, significant uh, accumulation mutations there, but it did have it in, in these other um, type four pillus uh, genes. So it's really nice to us to know that, you know, if you use a phage that targets a type four pillus, the bacteria that evolve resistance actually come out, you know, with mutations in the pillus. Um, so that's, I mean, it sounds a little bit stupid, I realize, but it's just, it, it's nice to know that what we put in causes a, a more predictable effect. Okay, so then I guess another question we often get is, is it better to use cocktails or, or a series of phages? 
Um, the, the standard before was to use cocktails, um, and, and but we've obviously done some experiments to try and see you know which one is is maybe better. Um, and so to do this cocktail versus sequential work, we test this in a lab strain of E. coli actually because we have a really well characterized E. coli strain. Um, that's you know every single gene we know all the not we but like you know scientific community everybody knows what all these genes do so it was a really good uh, model system and we tested with four different phage here that we've characterized fairly well in the lab that have known receptors and genomes and everything so um, we use one that uses a type six uh, receptor so it's like a nuclear uh, outer membrane TSX one uses Tol C which is an antibiotic efflux protein um, OM uh, OMP A which is a you know maybe a virulence factor and then another one uses a cell wall of, of E. coli and we designed a series of experiments to test you know the effects of single phage and sequence versus a whole cocktail and that is was designed as follows. Uh, we had a control population that we split into four and exposed it to one of the four phages, allow you know evolution to happen and resistance to occur. We then exposed those populations to the remaining three phage that hadn't seen before. And then from there, we allowed it to evolve resistance. And then we collected uh, and we exposed it to two more phage separately. And then we exposed it to the final phage. Um, and at each time point, we collected the population, sequenced it, and looked at uh, the phenotypes. So we tested antibiotic sensitivity and then sensitivity to all the other phages. Uh, we did this also with each of the possible phage combinations, a two-phage, three-phage, and four-phage cocktail. And then we did a control where we just serially passaged the, the bacteria without exposure to the phage just to make sure that you know, we could uh, control for, for drift. Um, and then we did this actually in triplicate with three independent populations. And we also did it with this standard lab strain and then a mutator strain. But just to simplify, we'll just talk about one, one group here. Um, and so one of the first things that we noticed straight away in doing the phenotype assays was that uh, mucoidy evolves quickly, right? It just, you can tell when you look at them, they're really extra goopy. Um, and then also comes out in the sequencing. Um, you can see which genes are involved. So. Uh, we looked at this mucoidy and it's associated with uh, T7 exposure, which is this phage that uses the, you know, the, the deep part of the cell wall. Um, we also found that exposure to cocktail, uh, independent of whether T7 was actually in it. So in some of the two phage and three phage cocktails where T7 wasn't present, we also got um, uh, mucoidy to evolve. Um, and it's also associated with cross resistance, right? So in the case where it was exposed only to phage, T7, say, and it, and it evolved mucoidy as the resistance mechanism, uh, it actually ends up that it's resistant now that it's mucoid to the other phages involved, which is not, uh, not very good, right? So why mucoidy? Um, well, if you look at the bacteria and here's some of the receptors, you know, it's possible that this capsule that forms covers the receptor binding sites of these phage uh, or, or in some other way makes it difficult for the phages to, to dig in there and find the receptor. Um, so if that's the case, are all strains destined to become mucoid, um, especially if you're going to use phage therapy? Um, and I think, at least in the case of E. coli, the answer is no. Um, and we have some good evidence in Pseudomonas as well that that's not the case, um, as we have a phage-based solution for this as well. Um, so we have a phage that actually seems to encode some sort of enzyme uh, or something uh, that degrades the capsule. And this phage actually requires a mucoid strain to infect. So basically, if you're mucoid, and E. coli, um, you're probably sensitive to this phage. This phage, when you expose bacteria to it, it basically, the bacteria evolves resistance quickly, but at the cost of not being mucoid anymore. And then once it loses the mucoid, it's actually resensitized to all these other phages that we used in the beginning. And so we're obviously, you know, continuing to study this. We have a lot more uh, work to do there because um, it's actually kind of a big study, um, but we've got quite a bit and we're just looking at the last bit with throwing in this mucoid dependent phage. Okay, so then when we looked at sequencing, so we sequenced each of these populations at every time point, right? So we crunched that through the computer um, and we looked at what we're calling off-target and on-target target mutations, where on-target mutations would be the mutations associated with uh, the receptor binding site, right? And so when you just use a single phage you know, in series, um, we ended up with 60 something percent of the mutations were actually predictable in the receptor binding site locations um, with the remaining 37% uh, elsewhere. Um, and then when you, that number goes way down when you pair them or put triples or, or phage 
cocktails together, it looks like it's way less predictable in how the bacteria population responds, at least in the system, in the way that we uh, tested it. So, um, so I guess this, this may be for us at least, would suggest that maybe a series of use of phages might be beneficial, right? So when we did the same as before with looking at the statistics of it, um, in a similar table here, the receptor genes in the single phage exposed seem to be the mostly significant ones, whereas the cocktails, it's, it's pretty randomly distributed. Okay, so then, you know, how do you choose an appropriate phage course, right? So should it be cocktail, should it be sequential? Um, I think it, it really depends on, you know, what's going on and what your goal is. I think if it's an acute, uncomplicated, and, and maybe drug resistant, and fully realize that drug resistance could be a complication, uh, maybe a cocktail is the best way to go in that, you know, you just need to depress the population so that um, the immune system can take over and, and finish the job or antibiotics, right? Whereas in the sequential side, um, in a case that's probably more familiar, uh, more relevant in the CF case, um, where it's a chronic infection that's complicated, with maybe some bronchiectasis or something, and there's a high probability of recolonization so that you can basically sculpt the population so that, you know, it occupies the niche still that a virulent bacteria might occupy, but, uh, it's, you know, reduced uh, virulence or, or causing less tissue damage so that when there is an exacerbation, then it could be easier to manage. Um, so that's been our approach so far, at least in the CF space. Okay, so the next step is deployment, um, where we're delivering uh, phage and taste testing samples and analyzing them and, and following up. Um, and this is where I'm going to hand it off to John. Um, but just real quick, we're also aware that phage don't necessarily uh, have the best tissue penetration. Um, and so we try to maximize the delivery of phages to the infection site. And so we're, we're also doing a lot of work there. Um, anyway, so I guess now I will hand off to, to Dr. Koch, who can talk about the cool clinical work that we've been doing. Well, thanks, Ben. That was fantastic as always. Um, and so I'm going to go into much more of the clinical application. And um, what I would like to highlight uh, for everyone is which which in the CF community we're we're very familiar with in terms of understanding um, uh, antibiotic resistance and specifically for pseudomonas I think um, and some of our other um, uh, more difficult to treat gram negatives and certainly NTM uh, that an antibiotic resistance crisis is is the next pandemic that we're going to be uh, thinking about um, uh, you, you know after we deal with COVID. Um, and the WHO highlights this for 2050. If you can see my cursor here, that this is going to uh, be important around the world for infections as um, resistance to antibiotics increases uh, with frequency and our pipeline is limited. And so that gets us to phage therapy and quoting um, uh, Sanskrit or, or famously Winston Churchill, the enemy, my enemy is my friend. Uh, so the application, as you heard from um, Dr. Chen or, uh, you know, from Ben is, has, uh, has been worked, you know, has been thought about since the early 1900s. But issues, I think, that are relevant for how we think about deploying phage therapy really relate to standardization and purification, which I think we have a handle on. Efficacy is going to be very important in terms of how we identify uh, the appropriate patient and patient situation. Delivery has been alluded to so that we get it directly into the particular tissue of interest in the case of CF, the lungs. Um, nebulization, I think, comes up higher on the list, uh, but certainly IV is, um, has been evaluated. And the treatment algorithm, which you heard from uh, Ben about, where um, single sequential phage has a role um, in, uh, compared to cocktail. And so the literature is, is um, actually getting quite robust. We have these uh, single cases, um, this case from uh, um, uh, the uh, Nature Medicine uh, using a uh, cocktail of phages to treat uh, mycobacterium abscessus or, or non-tuberculous mycobacterium in a CF patient post lung transplant um, was a fantastic story of success. And you can see that some other um, uh, relevant cases have been described for cystic fibrosis in terms of uh, patients receiving treatment before or, or um, after transplant, and then also focusing on the um, uh, uh, sinuses. And this is a great summary by Dwayne Roach and, um, and his group looking at all of the um, available reports in the literature uh, using phage therapy, as you can see here from 2005 to 2020, um, with uh, a focus on compassionate use and clinical trials. 
For our part, um, as you heard from uh, uh, Ben, we are uh, focusing on, um, especially for this talk, on CF patients who uh, are in the outpatient setting. And we typically were nebulizing phage from um, seven to 10 days. Um, we did a series of studies to show that changing how air is circulated in the room for negative uh, pressure is not required. Um, and that allows for us to do this in, in more of our standard patient rooms. And from an outcome perspective, we're gonna collect sputum and we're gonna follow these patients clinically. And um, on the right, you can see examples of Ben here uh, with the first um, CF patient uh, being treated with nebulized phage and the both of us in, um, in our clinic in, um, in, um, at, at Yale, um, also doing treatment. We obviously got permission from these individuals to, to show these pictures. Um, and uh, so far we have um, one graft um, uh, treated that was published by, by Ben and his group. We have two patients with non-CF bronchiectasis who received inhaled phage. This list is actually increasing currently. Um, and we have um, uh, 12 patients, uh, 11 with Pseudomonas, one with a Chromobacter. This list is actually also uh, larger um, as of um, uh, uh, two weeks ago. So this uh, process continues. And when we report out uh, the patients, you can see here just trying to put together a list where the non-CF bronchiectasis patients are older. We have um, many more women than men with uh, CF who have pan-drug resistant or multi-drug resistant pseudomonas. You can see here the phages that we used, and I'll talk to you about the, the impact and the trade-off. So the most important impact um, that, that Ben wanted to measure, and we all want to measure, is whether or not we're getting a decrease in the amount of uh, bacteria in the sputum from our patients after treatment. And so here we're measuring the sputum uh, produced by our patients after phage therapy. And we're looking at a time point that's about a week after they finished this, the phage therapy. And you can see that we see this significant decrease in the CFUs per ml. That's about a log and a half, um, which is consistent with what you see with IV antibiotics and uh, studies for inhaled antibiotics. But obviously those uh, types of studies have been done in a larger population of patients. Uh, but the fantastic thing that we also saw, which really highlighted our, our interest about pursuing this in the CF community, is um, that there was an increase in lung function for the individuals that were treated. And on the right, we're showing you that this increase in lung function um, really cuts off dependent on what the baseline lung function is for, for the individuals that are treated. So if you're above 30 um, or 40% predicted, you seem to have a bigger response. And below that number, you seem to have a smaller response. Having said that, with the, the individuals with uh, lung function below 30% who received phage therapy, you know, and, and had an improvement in it, you can see there two of them, of uh, 5% predicted, uh, you know, thought that that was pretty meaningful. And you could argue that that's pretty meaningful for what we see even with medications like Trikafta, um, where a small amount of improvement in lung function may be occurring with the lower FEV1 starting point. But also the, the consideration that maybe there's an effect on the pseudomonas and uh, lung inflammation, which I'll get to in a second, uh, that could be impacting the patients above the 30% predicted really drove our interest in looking at this in a clinical trial. And the trade-off that you heard about from uh, uh, previously is also occurring. So in, in individuals who had, in, and in this case had pan-drug resistant and uh, multi-drug resistant pseudomonas, and to take a step back, um, all of this was done through uh, an FDA um, uh, uh, emergent IND mechanism to get approval from the FDA and approval from our IRBs. Um, uh, in order for us to initiate it. So not surprising that these were multi-drug resistant and pan-drug resistant pseudomonas that we're treating. But it was really exciting to see that when we target the, um, uh, the receptor for the phage to bind, uh, that's called, um, uh, well, it's an efflux pump, which is essentially a mechanism for the bacteria to push out antibiotics uh, from inside the cell that after treatment, 
um, uh, you would see a change. And so pre-treatment is in blue, post-treatment is in red. So uh, there was resistance to aminoglycosides like tobramycin prior to treatment, and that de decreased dramatically. We saw the same thing for the beta-lactam. So uh, we test for um, ceftazidine um, um, and, um, and uh, um, uh, zosin, sorry, zosin, and then ceftazidine for the um, uh, cephalosporins. However, there's no change in the fluoroquinolones, which isn't that surprising when we talk to our, our um, uh, when, when I talked to uh, Ben and our other uh, experts in pseudomonas because of the mechanism for fluoroquinolone resistance. But this also allows for us to think about how to understand inflammation. And in these experiments um, that I'm describing for you, we, um, we really focused on using uh, airway epithelial cells and mouse models to see if we could understand the amount of inflammation that's being generated uh, in response to the phage. And the hypothesis is that if we target particular receptors on the pseudomonas, we may see a decrease in that. And so this is um, a cartoon just showing you that we have um, sputum before phage therapy and afterwards. Um, we then uh, isolate the pseudomonas, culture them up, collect their supernatants. So this is the, the junk that the pseudomonas is making on top of those cells that would be um, produced in, in the lung in addition to the bacteria being there. We collect those supernatants and we then um, put them into uh, the lungs of the mice um, or on epithelial cells um, that are um, airway epithelial cells that are grown in culture. And um, I'm gonna kind of go through this quickly, but the basic concept is that, that there's evidence for the trade-off to, uh, to um, also suggest decrease in inflammation. So this, again, uh, pre-phage and post-phage, you can see a change from the green to this yellow color. Uh, and this is actually one of the things that uh, Ben picked out to find a phage that would make this happen. And we found that pyocyanin, which is a, a dye, so it's a green dye, was mediating this effect. So pre-phage, you see it's high, post-phage it goes down, and it goes down as we continue to treat individuals. And pyocyanin is associated with inflammation and a bunch of activating uh, factors in the lung, like mucus secretion and, and others that lead to uh, inflammation and, and um, pathology that you could imagine could be happening in CF. So um, this is a busy slide, but the point is that when we put the supernatants on the uh, epithelial cells or into the mouse, we see a change in the signal uh, between pre and post phage that suggests that there's a decrease in inflammation that's occurring. So we so far have given phage uh, to individuals without evidence of significant side effects. Individuals are tolerating the inhalation of phage. Um, we've been able to see a trade-off, as I mentioned, whether it's antibiotic sensitivity or decreased inflammation. We're able to do this with uh, um, help from the FDA to get approval and obviously from our local IRBs at, uh, at our different institutions. Um, and we think we have an, ex, uh, an effective dosing regimen that we have identified in the different parts of the hospital. If someone's really sick in the ICU or if they're on the hospital floor, or as I showed you in the outpatient setting. There's a potential for personalized medicine. We think about how the uh, patient is doing. Do they have a lot of inflammation? Do they have pseudomonas that's multi-drug resistant? What are our goals here? And can we address them with phage? And we have evidence that we can retreat the same individual without um, seeing any type of toxicity. And ongoing studies are gonna look at um, uh, whether or not there are uh, antibodies de uh, developed or whether or not we see an effect from the phage. And so um, I think it's worth noting that while there's a lot of literature, especially from the um, uh, Tbilisi, um, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the phage program in Tbilisi, Georgia, the country of Georgia, and there's a lot of patients who've previously been treated. We clearly need additional clinical trials to make sure that we identify the safety and efficacy that, that we've talked about. We favor delivery through nebulization to directly get it into the CF lung. Uh, ben described to you the strategy where we know that phage resistance will occur. So the bacteria are going to, especially pseudomonas, will evolve resistance. 
But in doing so, we have a strategy to uh, manipulate them so they're less inflammatory or they, uh, we introduce increased susceptibility to antibiotics. You can see we highlighted an approach where single phage may work well in the CF community and that longitudinal treatment may be a goal for us. The regulatory piece in terms of how the FDA is going to treat phage therapy is um, an unknown. And obviously there are a lot of conversations uh, going on about that. And um, we're very interested to see how that's going to develop. That prompted us to look into a study for uh, that we call sci-fi um, at Yale, which is a single center study looking at phage versus placebo uh, for safety and the effect on pseudomonas. Um, and I'm going to just summarize here that uh, this study is ongoing. If there's any interest to please reach out to us. Um, we now have a mechanism to uh, uh, bring patients to Yale for this type of um, study uh, and through funding from internally at Yale and also from the CF Foundation. Um, we also have additional phase uh, studies in CF going on, and these are some of them that I'm aware of, and it's very exciting to see these because uh, it will help address uh, the question about um, the effect uh, and the efficacy of cocktails and also IV administration of phage. And at Yale, we're certainly looking at continuing to try and treat individuals while these studies are going on, uh, expanding our library, in particular targeting Burkholderia. And we um, have a, a fantastic phage that Ben has identified for um, MRSA, uh, MRSA, um, that we're very excited to, uh, uh, to think about using and developing for a clinical trial. Uh, and with that, uh, Ben and I certainly want to thank all of our patients and their families, the phage program, folks in my lab, the adult CF program, and, um, and our funders. And with that, we'll take any questions. All right. Thank you, Dr. Chan and Dr. Koff. There we go. <laughs> uh, great talk. And now we'll take some questions from our audience, Siri. Hello, yes, I echo incredible, incredible amount of information. So fascinating. Now, some of them, I see Dr. Chan has been wonderfully answering things in the chat box, but a key question somebody had asked about how to access those clinical trials and what is the eligibility for the trials? Uh, so, yeah, so uh, that's a great question. And I think, um, sorry, I can't see the chat on mine. So uh, I, I'll try and help out with those questions. There are several trials, so it really depends on um, the specific trial. For the vast majority of them, we're looking at individuals who have pseudomonas in their sputum, whose lung function is above 40% um, uh, predicted, or some of them require a higher baseline. Some of them also top out at 100%, others do not, and, um, and uh, a stable disease, right? So that there are no new medications introduced. If you're recently on modulators, um, you need to wait a certain amount of time and no recent exacerbations and no recent participation in clinical trials. So all of those are kind of the common requirements. Um, but, um, but we can get into the specifics. You can communicate with um, myself or um, Claire Cochran is at, um, at Yale as our research coordinator, but also your local CF uh, program will be able to tell you about um, the existing studies that are going on through the TDN, which is obviously the CF Foundation's Therapeutic Development Network. The program, the study at Yale is not part of the TDN, so, um, so please reach out to me specifically for that and I can provide that information. Thank you. And we had a question. Does it matter if the pseudomonas is mucoid or non-mucoid? Is there a difference for eligibility? No, that, there's no difference. Um, the, the vast majority of these treatments are looking for individuals who are you know, colonized with pseudomonas, have had pseudomonas for an extended period of time. Uh, I would expect that to be mucoid in our CF patients, but, uh, but if it has not been characterized that way, that, that won't change uh, the inclusion. I think um, Ben and I would be very interested in, in some of those samples if it wasn't mucoid so that we could study this because that would be very helpful information. And I know Dr. Chan, you answered in the chat, but for those who aren't keeping up with that, um, there were questions about what other pathogens are being addressed with this therapy. Sure, yeah, sorry, I'm trying to multitask with the chat. Um, so we're looking at tons of bacteria really. So definitely uh, Pseudomonas, obviously, 
staff. Um, we have pages for Klebsiella, E. coli, uh, Citrobacter, uh, Serratia, Stenotrophomonas, Acinetobacter, Acromobacter. Um, I guess that's unless and most of the big ones for CF. Um, I, I might have missed one, but um, if I did, I, I, we, we probably have page for it. I don't know. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, let's see. Mara asks, seems that pan resistance in women is higher. Is there anything that would indicate women would respond to phage therapy differently as well? Can the gender difference be modeled in the mice studies? Yeah, that's a great question. I think before we go to that step, um, that's really uh, a little bit of a sampling issue for us in terms of how people were made aware and, and, and the individuals that did approach us for phage therapy. But if we do see that type of effect uh, more broadly, um, then, uh, then I think it absolutely can be modeled. Uh, there are obviously limitations to the mouse. Uh, it's a great model for exactly what you're describing, but it's lack of ability to kind of develop bronchiectasis and, and, and the clinical correlate to, to human disease makes it harder to keep the, the bacteria and phage um, alive in the, in the CF lung without the mouse clearing it. And so, um, and so that is something that we are thinking about modeling more in vitro and using other uh, cell systems but it may be a great example of something that needs to be done in some of these larger animal models um, so that we, um, so that we can get an answer at that. It's a great, that's a great question. We have requests for your slides. We all, wait, is it possible to make those available to attendees or no? Uh, so we would love to, there is some data on this that is unpublished. So I think Ben and I would need to just go over that and then we can, Provide it to um, to CFRI and they can uh, disseminate it. Uh, uh, you know, and um, but I, I would like to remove the the kind of proprietary information if that's okay with everyone. Very well understood. Uh, we had a question from Gabriella about uh, negative side effects from this therapy. Yeah, it's a great question, really important. So the studies will, will get at that, um, obviously. The most common uh, um, uh, issue that individuals have mentioned when they receive phage is about uh, 48 to 72 hours, a little bit longer, depending on the individual, is uh, increased um, uh, kind of uh, fatigue, feeling like there, um, there's some ongoing inflammation has been described to me. Uh, one patient uh, initially uh, early on described that it feels like what happens when you have antibiotics that are working, quote unquote, and that's been repeated actually for, for three other patients. So I think that is a common theme. Low grade temperatures uh, have been described. No one has actually had a, a, a true temperature. Um, and, um, uh, but the, uh, and there has been no problem with the inhalation, uh, but that's something that's, uh, that's being uh, discussed. And um, there is a potential with um, uh, the FDA has asked us to monitor liver function tests. I think that's from data from IV therapy that uh, the liver function testing might uh, change over time. But that obviously happens with our CF patients. We have not seen that with inhaled therapy. And so, um, so we are following all of these things very carefully, uh, but, but we're, the, we're in, in the study, uh, we are monitoring patients very closely, asking them to record a diary. And, um, and so we're looking to make sure that we do not miss additional uh, uh, side effects. Uh, but that's why these studies need to be done to identify the safety um, and, and ensure that we're not missing something that could be uh, detrimental. I think one thing that's always asked about is whether or not treating Pseudomonas with the phage is leading to other bacteria becoming problematic. And our first pass at this from the patients that I described to you is that is not the case. Uh, we see a decrease in Pseudomonas, but it's not as if staph or MRSA comes up and becomes a huge pathogen or, or fungus or something else. We are not seeing that. But, but again, we're looking at data from seven to 12 patients, and we need a much larger data set to confirm that that's not an issue. And Dr. Chan, I know you mentioned many of the pathogens, but there are still more coming in. Um, two things, one about whether there are any clinical trials for NTM, 
uh, to be treated. And then somebody who's also worried about fungus, um, C. oris. Yeah, sure. So for NTM, I don't know about trial. Maybe John could uh, chime in there, but there's definitely compassionate cases that have been treated for NTM uh, in CF. Um, and, you know, it, it's the, the guy that's really leading that is named Graham Hatful. He's at Pittsburgh. Um, but obviously, if someone emails us, we can connect whoever to whoever. Um, and then uh, fungus, unfortunately, no, we don't have any. Uh, biological tool there, it's, we can only deal with bacteria. Yes, yeah, so I'm not aware of a clinical trial for uh, NTM. I know that Graham and his group are actively um, supporting uh, compassionate use cases, which is what we have done. Um, and I, um, I, I, we are discussing um, at the North American CF conference, a case of, um, of NTM being treated by phage. And um, I'm gonna be a discussant for that. So we will be, I know there'll be at least one case presented, but uh, I, I agree with Ben, I, I, we don't have that information, but we can connect anyone to Dr. Hatfo and his, and his group. Um, uh, I know there's a lot of interest, but I think the ongoing studies in NTM may have to be a little bit better developed um, for us to then know where we could insert phage into that uh, algorithm. Um, and there's also a significant concern, not, not concern, but there's a challenge in the NTM phage uh, discovery where it, it requires looking for many and many um, uh, phages on the order of thousands often to find one that's gonna work for a particular NTM strain. So, so it, it, there are some challenges inherent in that disease. Well, we've gone over time, but there's one last question that many people are interested in. So I'll ask that one last question of you both um, from Beata Illig. How can the phage permeate the airway mucus? Uh, yeah, I wrote a brief uh, response in there. There are two mechanisms that we think are happening. One is there's the potential for phage to survive on the mucus, um, uh, kind of waiting for bacteria to, to escape kind of the, the biofilm. The second is actually phage, uh, when they're produced, do have some enzymes that have some um, kind of mucus penetrating properties. Um, and uh, I believe those are actually being considered in as, as potential therapeutic options. Uh, and that has been studied. Uh, 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 I'm not sure, Ben, do you have any other comments on, on, on that mechanism? No, no, that, that's, that covers it. And I, I think I put one answer in the chat somewhere, but yeah, that's it. 